My name is Larry Larson. I'm Dean of Engineering, and it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to the uh, latest installment of the Thinking Out Loud series. Today's lecture is entitled Teaching Old Bacteria New Tricks. Before we introduce our speaker today, I want to say a little bit about the Thinking Out Loud series. Uh, you know, at, at Brown, we love to ask really tough and interesting questions, and we always like those questions to be at the boundaries between traditional domains of knowledge. And Professor Chris Rose, who I'll be introducing shortly, introduced the Thinking Out Loud series in 2014 in order to address these very, these very questions, you know, at the frontiers of science and at the boundaries between disciplines. And, you know, in the intervening five years, it's hard to believe it's been that long, we've had some amazing, amazing speakers. We've heard about abstract mathematics, we've heard about anesthesia, we've heard about supersymmetry, and we've heard about exoplanets. And in fact, you know, the research that we've, that we've heard about in these lectures uh, has led directly to, you know, some amazing results. For example, you know, this, uh, in, the, in the first year of this series, we heard from uh, Professor John Johnson at Harvard, who gave us an amazing, amazing talk on the search for exoplanets. Uh, in the in the in the universe around us, and of course, just this week, the Nobel Prize in Physics was was awarded for the early pioneers in that exoplanet search. So we hear about really cutting edge uh, work in these in this lecture series, and today's lecture is is continues in that very fine tradition. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome. Uh, professor Cristala uh, Prather, the Arthur D. Little Professor of uh, Chemical Engineering at MIT. Uh, she's going to be talking about some amazing work that is really at the boundaries of, you know, synthetic biology, chemical engineering, bioengineering, and it's addressing some amazing and really challenging uh, uh, problems that, that face the world today, and I think that the things she's proposing will have world, you know, altering results. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce my dear friend and colleague, Professor Chris Rose, who initiated this series five years ago and will be introducing our speaker. Chris. So I guess the first thing uh, that I always do with this series, how many people have been to a Thinking Out Loud before? Okay, so you, you kind of know what comes next. Uh, does everybody have a program? You picked up one, Jody made sure that we had programs. Okay, so, you know, we, we've got uh, uh, Crystal Pr Prather, uh, Arthur D. Little, you know, chair professorship, fellow of this, this, the, I, it, read it. That's not what I'm, that's not what this series is about. Um, the fact that uh, anybody is here giving this talk means that they're incredibly accomplished. They're aspirational academics, people we want to be, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, folks that, that, uh, that need the kudos and lauding. But what I, want to, uh, what I want to start out with is that uh, Chris is part of a tradition uh, that started in the late 60s. Uh, uh, Larry mentioned Jim Gates, who's a supersymmetry guy. He was at MIT. He was part of that first vanguard of folks that came through, folks of color that came through. Um, he was a role model for me. After that uh, came Paula, who is a uh, Paula Hammond, who is uh, chair of chemical engineering at MIT. Chris saw Paula. And now, and I'm going to tell you something, there's a common thread to all of these people except me. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not me. So come, Chris comes along, and uh, you took your appointment in 2004, right? And that was before, I believe, biological engineering uh, was established at MIT. I think the department actually started around 2005. So biological engineering, as opposed to bioengineering, is uh, actually genetic engineering. So uh, that, it's called biological engineering at MIT. So I want you to think about this a little bit. You've got somebody that's uh, fresh out of a job, meaning you, know, you came out of graduate school in 99 or something like that, and uh, was in industry for a little while, and now she's going to go into academe. And nobody really knows what genetic engineering is at this point. It's basically a black art. You know, who knows what it is? And this is somebody that's going to now be, I mean, on tenure track at MIT, and there she's going to create new materials and new processes using bugs, essentially. So that's a little crazy. I mean, it, honest to God, it's a, it's a little crazy. And that is actually the common thread with all of these folks. Everybody that I try to invite here is just a little crazy. And what that means, <laughs> right, what that means, though, is that they look at the world differently. They look at it and see what could be and what is it that's interesting about this particular problem. So 
you know, uh, Chris has been at it for, I guess, 15 years now to, you know, with uh, really great success. So with that, I want to introduce you to Chris Prather, my wonderful, uh, I guess you're, you're, she's a baby, she's not even a baby sister, you're my niece, you know, because you're just, and I just want to welcome you to Brown and, uh, you know, it's just a wonder and a great thing to have you here, finally. <laughs> it took a little doing. So we'll come around this way. And you get the, you get the obligatory hug. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I'm deciding if I should take exception to the characterization of being just a little crazy. Um, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been my pleasure to be here all day. I've engaged in some wonderful conversations, both with faculty colleagues and with students and with staff. Um, and it's very clear that you have something very special happening here. Um, and I've said to, to several people, I have a 15-year-old daughter, so now I'm acutely aware of looking for special things on college campuses. Um, and so I congratulate you on having um, uh, set a very good example for a parent uh, in terms of the things that I've seen today. Um, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is I did follow the instructions to prepare a talk for a general audience. The bad news is that I'm still an academic. So that means I've prepared some introductory slides to try to put what we do into context, both the general context of why we do what we do and to put into context how we do what we do. Um, but then I gotta talk about science, you know, like detailed, detailed science. So uh, hopefully the first sort of 10 or 12 slides will be really interesting and exciting. And as, I, as I, if I start to see the eyes glazing over, um, I'll scan the crowd for those one or two people who came here to really hear about biology, um, and we can have a more in-depth conversation afterwards. Does that sound fair? All right, very good. Um, so a few years ago, actually, when I was at uh, the Radcliffe Institute, and I see one of my fellow Radcliffe fellows the same year, Susan Moffat in the audience, I had the same challenge, which was how to describe the work that we do to an extraordinarily diverse group of individuals who are all very accomplished scholars, but across a really, really wide variety of disciplines. Um, and at the time, someone had introduced me to this thing called Wordle. I don't even know if that Wordle is still there. Um, but what Wordle allows you to do is to take a bunch of words and stick them together and have this visual representation um, of, of dominance. And I took the titles of every paper that we published across the first 10 years of my lab and stuck them in a Wordle, and it was actually quite amazing. So the first thing that pops out is production. And then you see, uh, it's slow, because my, my PowerPoint skills aren't that good. Then you see engineering pop up next. Um, there are two words that go together, which is Escherichia coli, um, and then there's pathway. And I thought, well, how amazing. This actually describes these four words or phrases very well what it is that we do. And that is that we in my lab engineer new pathways uh, in E. coli as a bacterium to be able to produce chemical products, right? So apparently, um, this is what I set out to do when I started as an academic, um, and I published a bunch of papers that sort of confirm, yep, this is the thing that we're doing. So the next question is why? What's our motivation for using biology to do this? And as Chris pointed out, I'm in a chemical engineering department um, even though the work that we do uses biology, biology as a substrate, I often get asked, why are you in a chemical engineering uh, department doing a bunch of bioengineering? And here's our motivation, and I've borrowed a phrase from a colleague of mine at MIT named Brad Olson, who says what we really need is a paradigm shift in how we think about chemical manufacturing. And it's based on the fact that currently we have a CH2 or hydrocarbon-based view of how we gain access uh, to both chemicals and to uh, energy for that matter. And that involves using crude oil as an input, and as, uh, as a result of refining that crude oil, there are a lot of fuels that we often think about. And then there's this other segment of chemicals, petrochemicals, that are very useful. Okay, useful for what? Um, you are sitting on chairs that are covered in fabric. I don't have proof, um, but I am certain to about 99.95% those uh, fibers were made from oil because most fibers are synthetic and most of those synthetic fibers actually come from oil. Um, I have a plastic casing in this pointer here. That plastic is a polymer uh, that comes from oil. Okay, uh, and 
I happen to believe that climate change is a problem. Uh, and so if you actually want to think about how do you find replacements for crude oil as inputs to the system, the question is where can you go to get more carbon for these useful purposes? So rather than focusing on uh, hydrocarbons, we can think about using carbohydrates as inputs to that. And so when we now are looking at carbohydrates, we're talking about biomass. Biomass um, are grasses, they are uh, agricultural residues, they are specifically cultivated crops to be used as feedstocks. And for years, uh, the focus was on using those for biofuels. But you can think about other ways of providing energy. So I could, uh, if I wanted to spend that much money for Tesla, buy a totally electric vehicle and never have to worry about putting gasoline into my car again. Okay? Um, I'm sort of, uh, actually I'm not sort of, I'm, I'm pretty confident I'm never gonna fly to Asia on a battery powered aircraft. But for most of what you see on the road, it's very conceivable to think about electrifying the transportation grid. Okay? And the reason for that is that when we're using this side, when we're thinking about the fuels, what we're interested in is the energy and those carbon-carbon bonds. But when you're sitting on those chairs, or when I'm using this clicker, what I'm concerned about is the mass. There are properties associated with that mass, and I can't replace the mass with electrons. I can't replace the mass with solar or with wind or with other forms of renewable energy. So we really have to think about how do we actually get these other chemicals and allow them to be effectively replaced so that we can really, in a future, consider a true carbon negative or carbon, either carbon neutral or carbon negative way of accessing both the materials and the energy that we need for society. And we're interested in doing that so we can decrease CO2 emissions. We want to be able to develop processes that actually require less energy um, and are greener, but the challenge is they still have to be economical. Okay? So why do we use biology to do this? You might say, well, why don't you just take this biomass and figure out ways to use traditional chemistry to do this as well? And there are certainly others that, that do that. We're focused on using microbes because microbes, it turns out, are actually very good chemists. Okay, and so here are a couple of representations of uh, um, uh, edible uh, materials that you may be accustomed to, which actually rely upon these properties of biology as chemical factories in order to produce the product of interest. And what's happening in this case is that you have sugar being provided as a feedstock or an input. There is a yeast organism that's going to convert that to ethanol. Right, and I'm assuming most of you don't really care how this happens. Right? You care more about, right? you don't care how it happens. I care how it happens. So if I look more closely at sugar going to ethanol, first off, it's important to recognize these are actually chemical compounds. Sugar in this case is glucose, six carbons, six oxygens, 12 hydrogens, and that's being converted to ethanol. And because I know that that sugar, that glucose is going to ethanol, there's a specific chemical reaction associated with that. And now it actually turns out there's a series of chemical reactions that allow you to take one molecule of glucose and produce two molecules of ethanol from that. And you see you get CO2 being released uh, as well. And so now the question is, well, how do we get back again to this biology part of it doing chemistry? And this relies on what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. So you may remember learning in biology, DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. Okay? And effectively that means that the DNA that's carried in these biological systems is able to be converted or transcribed into an RNA molecule, and those RNA molecules are translated into proteins. And one particular class of these proteins are enzymes, and those enzymes can be produced uh, in very large quantities, and it is these enzymes or collections of enzymes that allow you to do these chemical reactions. All right, so the bottom line is we know biology is already a really phenomenal chemist. It's just that most of biology, with the exception of this reaction here, produces things that we're not necessarily interested in valorizing. Or we're not necessarily interested in making products out of them. There are, however, other uh, molecules that are produced by biology that have other interesting properties that have been exploited for the benefit of humans. So I have here uh, two examples. This is a compound called lovastatin. This is caspofungin, and caspofungin is an antifungal or, uh, molecule, so it's used to treat infections. 
And lovastatin was one of the first cholesterol-lowering drugs. Now, I will admit here, uh, if you looked at my bio, I actually spent some time at Merck, and I've always used these as my examples um, because I first made this slide when I worked at Merck, and those academics in the room know, don't remake a slide if you don't have to. Okay? The point I'm making here is that these are actually compounds that were commercialized with biological processes, meaning that there were organisms that would naturally make these compounds, there were processes developed in order to produce them in very, very large quantities, and then purify them to use them for therapeutic purposes. And so for a long time, the idea was, yes, biology will do chemistry, but look at how complex that is. Sure, a chemist might be able to make it, but when you're done and you have your yield of 0.1%, nobody's actually going to be able to commercialize that, right? Or even this one, which is less complex, it still actually has a lot of what we refer to as chiral centers. There's a lot of complex chemistry here that's not easily done biologically. So for a long time, the idea was let biology do the really hard stuff and leave the simpler molecules to chemists. I want to briefly introduce two other examples now. This is an amino acid, glutamic acid also known as MSG, um, monosodium glutamate, and an organic acid, malic acid. And I point those out because those also are commercially produced through fermentation. There are organisms that naturally produce the, these compounds in very, very high quantities. And they're actually quite a bit simpler. So you could, in fact, produce these molecules using chemistry at much, much higher yields and efficiencies than you can with these. But it turns out it's actually still more economical to make them through fermentation. Okay? So when I was in graduate school, I learned about the production of these molecules or molecules like this biologically. And I was trained in the field of metabolic engineering. And the goal of metabolic engineering was to improve upon the ability of organisms to make the compounds that they could naturally make better. And better always meant either making more, so increasing the concentration or tighter, making them faster, meaning inc increasing the production rate, or more efficiently, and we use the phrase yield, or the term yield, to talk about efficiency. It's a measure of how much of your starting material goes in is converted to the compound that comes out at the back end. Because you have to pay for what goes in, you're able to derive revenue from what comes out, and so the ratio of those you want to be as high as possible. So as the field evolved and developed, uh, there are a couple other examples I want to give you of using biology to do chemistry. Uh, one case that's a little bit more complex structurally, but another one that's very simple. And 1,3-propanediol in this case is very interesting because of the fact that it was a chemical known for years to have value if it could be produced economically. There were no chemical routes to allow this, and so it was only commercialized for biological production. Artemisinic acid is actually a precursor to an anti-malarial drug. And what makes these two compounds different than the others I told you about is that the commercial processes to manufacture them involved organisms that were not the native host for those pathways. So those enzymes are encoded by that DNA, and the DNA in nature was someplace else entirely. In the case of 1,3-propanediol, it was present in an organism called Klebsiella pneumoniae. Pneumonia, I remind you of what? Pneumonia. Probably not a, big, a good idea to grow up 100,000 liters of pneumonia, right, in order to make a chemical compound. So it was very clear that that would not be a suitable host for large-scale manufacturing. So the DNA encoding those enzymes were transferred to E. coli. In the case of artemisinic acid, now, this is actually naturally found in a plant in something called the sweet wormwood tree. Um, and it had been extracted from plants for a number of years, but to get the cost down for manufacturing, there was a very significant effort uh, that actually came out of my graduate lab to put this first in E. coli and then for manufacturing purposes uh, into yeast to be able to make uh, this chemical compound now in a scalable way. So I had learned about uh, this kind of work when I was in graduate school. I learned a little bit more about using biological systems to do chemical conversions when I was uh, working at Merck. And that actually inspired me to ask this question, which is, can we go one step further or another step further? And now, rather than just identifying pathways in an organism and moving them to a different organism, could we make our own molecules or make our own pathways to get to the molecules of interest that we wanted, okay? So um, that's kind of the intro part. You're going to have to look at some more structures now and some more biology stuff, okay? Um, we're ready? Yeah. All right, deep breath. 
Okay, let it out. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a compound we've worked on for a number of years, actually ever since I started the lab. Uh, for the, how many graduate students are in the room? Okay, the same people have not been working on this since I started the lab, all right? So you know, we, we, we finished one story, we let them go on. Um, and we were inspired to work on this molecule for a couple of reasons. One is that it had been identified by the Department of Energy as a so-called top value-added chemical from biomass. So what does that mean? So if you think back to the picture I showed you of this idealized biorefinery where you had biomass going in and you had fuels and chemicals coming out, the DOE at uh, one point about 15 years ago asked the question, what could we make from biomass that would have higher value than fuels? Everyone wants fuels to be as inexpensive as possible. We're all a little bit panicked when gas prices start to rise. But it turns out, uh, I mentioned before, that you get both fuels and chemicals from uh, traditional crude oil. By volume, overwhelmingly, the product, the input rather, goes to uh, fuels. But by value, they're about equivalent. So about 15% of the total of a barrel of oil in the US goes to these chemicals, but it's actually worth as much in terms of selling prices as the 85% that comes to uh, fuels. So DOE said, if we're gonna actually be able to replace petroleum, we have to be able to provide both low cost fuels and higher cost value added chemicals. And so what are things that we should be able to access from sugar? And this was one of the molecules on the list. Um, this is actually a natural product. So it's found in fruits and vegetables, which means that there are enzymes that are known to be able to produce it in a very specific series of chemical reactions, but there is no known microbial pathway for this. It's found in fruits and vegetables. There's also a byproduct of human metabolism. Okay? So our interest in this was could we create a pathway that was much more amenable towards production in a microbial host rather than the uh, pathways that had already been elucidated. Uh, it's used uh, now in the synthesis of Adderall. Um, I'm sure no one has heard of that. Um, and our interest is actually that uh, it, it turns out it's uh, very useful as a building block for nylons, but also as an additive for existing polymeric materials to give them enhanced properties. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in using them uh, as detergents in uh, wastewater treatment systems, as well as as de-icers. Uh, and I'll point out there are known routes to produce this molecule chemically, but there are difficulties both with being able to achieve appropriate price targets and achieving the purity that you need to be able to produce the compound for a lot of these uses that we're interested in. Um, and I note here that this is an acid catalyzed oxidation. That acid generates a lot of waste. And so remember, one of our objectives is to have greener processes. Uh, and so uh, I remember when I first learned about that process and was speaking to uh, a, a company who was interested in purchasing glucaric acid, and they said that the chemical routes actually wouldn't meet their uh, revised standards for green supply of materials. Okay? So we think biology is the answer here. Um, I'll point out again that there is a known pathway for this. This is the known pathway in uh, mammals. I've identified the product here up top. I'll point out that glucose is the substrate that we're interested in. Um, and you can see a lot of arrows. Each of those arrows uh, represents a chemical reaction. Uh, and if you count it up and you start it here, and you actually have to go this way and then that way, this ends up being uh, a minimum of 10 reaction steps. Uh, and Chris uh, noted that we're all a little bit crazy. And he also said, you know, you start uh, in a uh, academic position and you want to do something completely new that no one has ever done before, but there's this thing called a tenure review, and that has to happen in a certain period of time, right? And that time is less than, than 10 years. Um, and students want to graduate, um, and you know, you don't want them to plot your demise as they're going through their graduate program. So, Asking someone to try to rebuild that in a microbial cell just seemed like a lose, 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 lose proposition. All right? So there were lots of things that could be lost there. Um, but the advantage here was that as a natural product, we could find evidence in databases of chemical reactions, biochemical reactions involving these chemical compounds. Okay? So here's the pathway we ultimately put together. We actually started by asking, if we look at a database, where do we find glucaric acid being produced? Turns out you can produce that from a molecule called glucuronic acid, and that comes from a particular bacterium, um, and the enzyme is called urinate dehydrogenase. Now, when we first started the work, we actually didn't know the DNA sequence that could give us that compound. And so we were actually the first group to figure out the pieces of DNA that could lead to the proteins that gave us this activity. 
And that was sort of it as far as this particular host was concerned. It turns out this organism likes to consume both of these to use them as food. It doesn't actually make either one of them. So we go back in the database and say, okay, where do we find glucuronic acid being produced? You can make glucuronic acid from something called myonositol. The enzyme that's involved with this is actually from mouse. Uh, and from the one we use is from mouse. You can find other variants in plants as well as in other eukaryotes, so in fungal organisms, for those of you who think about biology. That's sort of the end of the story there. There wasn't uh, a good pathway to be able to make myonositol that wasn't extremely long. And then the last step, or the first step, depending on how you're counting, had actually been published. So we knew that you could take glucose, any e. coli, and get to an intermediate here that had to have a phosphate be removed, and you could get to your compound of interest, uh, in this case, myonositol. So putting all three of these together, we should be able to get a pathway that allows us to go from a simple starting substrate like glucose all the way down into glucaric acid. And I always think there has to be a joke in here somewhere. And it goes, a yeast, a mouse, and a bacterium walk into a bar. Um, and then I've never been able to figure out a good punchline for that, right? Um, but it's just interesting that there are these, we can pull things from different places, now bring them together, asking them to do the chemistry they've always done, but now in a totally different environment. So now we've got this new pathway uh, in E. coli, and that's great. But it turns out we have to get that pathway into a cell. And the cell, remember I said, is very good at doing chemistry already. And I gave you examples of a few different molecules that cells will make. Turns out cells make a lot more molecules than that. Right, so this is a representation of metabolism, which are all of the biochemical reactions that take place in a cell. And every dot here represents a distinct chemical compound, and the lines between them represent reactions, so conversion of one compound to another compound. Okay? So there's a lot of stuff that the cells could make, and a problem that we often run into is that, yes, we have the thing that we want to make, but the cells will also make things that we don't want to make. We call those byproducts. And traditionally, in order to identify ways to reduce byproducts, you rely on DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. You know that these dots are being produced as the result of chemical reactions. And so you say, well, this is the dot that I don't want. This is the enzyme or the reaction that produces that dot. That enzyme comes from a piece of DNA. If I remove that piece of DNA, I'm just gonna eliminate the ability to make that byproduct at all. And that's worked effectively in a number of cases. But what if the thing that you're competing with is survival of the cell itself? What if you're actually competing against growth and the, the innate uh, evolutionary uh, drive for all biological systems to be able to reproduce themselves? So we no longer have this option of saying, well, we're just going to knock out the competing pathways because now we have a system that's not viable at all. So this is a problem we've looked at for a number of years where our competing pathway can't be deleted. And so instead, what we've relied upon is this ability to actually build new devices to allow us to have dynamic control of how cells will process the material that we provide to them. Okay, now it's gonna really get into some biology. We're about 20 minutes in, everybody's hanging with me. All right, very good. So, and I gotta remember the arrow is different from the pointer. So here's a simplified view. The problem that we have is that the way glucose is used by the cell is that it comes in and it's converted to glucose 6-phosphate. And then there are two primary pathways, one that goes this way called the pentose phosphate pathway, one that's going straight down called glycolysis or the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway. And that's what the cell really wants to do with the glucose. It doesn't really care, to be honest, about making glucaric acid. There's another minor component in terms of how the cells are being used, and it's necessary for survival, but it's not sufficient. So you have to have the ability to make glucose 1-phosphate, but that in and of itself isn't enough. Okay, so we relied upon some mathematical modeling based on data that we could find in the literature and decided that what we wanted to do was to first knock out, so remove the gene encoding this enzyme. So now all of my glucose 6-phosphate goes down this way. And so my goal is to have a two-phase system. I want to say to the cell, fine, you want to grow, I'm going to let you grow. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is allow first the carbon to be utilized for growth. Use as much of it as you want. 
But at a certain point, you're going to have to stop and do me a favor instead. Okay? And at that point, what we want to do is to be able to restrict the flow of that carbon through a point in the pathway. And in doing so, what we're hoping is that we get a backlog, if you will, or a backup of material that will increase the concentration of that substrate that we have, and that provides more to go on the pathway that we're interested in, so that eventually we get more of our initial compound, and I'll show you some data uh, reporting this, and then finally getting into more glucaric acid. We actually refer to these as metabolite valves, because I'm a chemical engineer. And if you're in a chemical plant and you ask, what does a valve do? A valve allows you to regulate the flow of material from one part of the facility to another. If it's open, the same way the, the faucet works at home, if it's open, the water's gonna flow. If it's closed, it's gonna stop, okay? And so in this case, we want the carbon to flow here first. As a result of some sort of perturbation, we're gonna close that route, and then we want the flux to be rerouted or the flow to be rerouted into a pathway of interest, okay? So we first had this idea um, a while ago, like 2007 a while ago, okay? Uh, and it didn't work for a lot of reasons. Um, another note for the graduate students, it didn't work, fine. The student doesn't have to stay for another 10 years to make it work, right? We move on and figure out something else. Um, and when we first got this working, the <coughs> original way that we did this in terms of building these metabolite valves is to uh, get a tunable system. So it was dynamic in the sense that we could have it open or closed, but it was tunable to the extent of when the valve would be opened or closed. And we did that using something I call uh, inducible protein degradation, or something called inducible protein degradation. Okay? So the enzymes are proteins, and as long as they're there, they're gonna do chemical reactions. If I remove those proteins, they can no longer do the reactions. And one way to remove the proteins is just send a signal that says, it's time for you to be chewed up. They get chewed up, those amino acids get recycled elsewhere. Okay? Um, we were also uh, very interested in using a method that was independent of the specific pathway that we're interested in. Okay, so we, uh, besides working on very specific compounds, are generally interested in what are the best ways, the best mechanisms to allow us to engineer cells. And so we wanted this to work for glucaric acid, but we wanted it to work for other pathways as well. And so we actually had now uh, a small molecule, so a chemical compound that we could add at a particular point in time, or at any one of particular points in time, to be able to then send the signal to say, okay, it's time for you to stop growing, and now it's time for you to do some work for me, okay? So that'll work fine. The problem is that this still requires user intervention. So someone has to go into the lab, and when the time comes, add this small molecule inducer that says, yep, now you can go and do the switching. Now I always point out, it's clear that someone is not me, because I'm here. Right. My lab is back in Cambridge, and so grad students and postdocs are doing this. So ideally what we would like, and we think a lot about how this would translate into the industrial space, what we would like is something a little bit more passive. Okay, so we'd like the student, I actually don't want the students sleeping in the lab, but you know, it makes the point. We want the students to be able to start the cultures growing, and then have the cells decide, now is the time for this switching mechanism, and when they say it's time to go, they go and they do it all on their own. Okay, so how do we actually accomplish this? Well, it turns out biology, again, has a way in which it can coordinate behavior at a particular point in time. And this uses a mechanism known as quorum sensing, and it's been identified in a number of organisms. It actually has a very important role in disease uh, for a lot of indications when you're looking at bacterial infections. And so how does this work? There are actually a couple of very important uh, components to this. The first is that you have the DNA, and remember we said DNA is gonna to go to RNA. In order for the DNA to go to RNA, you have to have something called an RNA polymerase that will bind to that DNA and start the signal of transcription for you to be able to make that RNA, okay? If you block the ability of that RNA polymerase to bind, you actually prevent the gene from being expressed and so it's turned off, okay? So the first two components are a binding spot for your regulatory protein and then that regulatory protein. And in this system, it's called ESA-R, okay? The next part of this is a signaling molecule. So this red dot represents the signal that's part of quorum sensing. And so the theory behind how this works is that as cells grow, they start to make this molecule. 
the molecule is supposed to be rapidly diffusible, which means it's get, it gets made and then it says bye-bye and it goes outside of the cell and it just hangs out in the extracellular space. So if we're growing this in a vessel like this, the cells are making it and it's just going out into the water that's surrounding it. Well, once a certain concentration is reached, then that molecule can come back inside the cell. And when it comes back inside, it can interact with this regulatory protein. And in this case, binding of the signaling molecule to the regulatory protein causes it to come off of the DNA. So whereas initially I have now the bound uh, molecule sitting on the DNA blocking transcription, when this AHL builds up, uh, the signaling molecule is called AHL, when it builds up to a certain amount, it's actually gonna allow for the opening up of that uh, promoter to allow you to start transcription. And the reason it's called quorum sensing is because as you might imagine, if that signal is being made by these cells, the more cells I have, the faster I'm gonna accumulate the signal above a certain threshold. And so you reach quorum in order to trigger gene expression. Okay, so this is designed to initially have a system that starts off and it gets turned on. The reason we were interested in this particular system though is that it has a different configuration. And in this other configuration, this ESR regulatory protein still binds to the DNA, but now it does something different. It actually brings a friend with it and says, I want the RNA polymerase to come, and I actually want us to be able to make this RNA that's gonna result in the protein being produced. So now the default state is being on, and when the regulatory molecule, the signaling uh, molecule binds to the regulatory protein, it still comes off of the DNA, but now when it comes off, it takes its friend with it, and so this system goes from being on to being off. And that's actually the direction that we're interested in. We first want the system to be on in the sense of allowing the cell to utilize the carbon for growth, and then we want it to be turned off so that we don't make more protein. The protein that's there, we're gonna allow to be degraded, and that's gonna allow us to have this switching behavior. So we can construct now a, a system where we have the regulatory uh, protein being produced, that is controlling the expression of some gene of interest that we're interested in. It has a tag on it so that we stop making new RNA and then we degrade the existing protein that's there. And then the last part of this, in order to get something tunable, is that the time at which this switching behavior happens should be a function of how quickly I generate the signaling molecule. And so I can now have a library of different variants where the rate at which the synthase, the protein that makes my signaling molecule is being produced, varies. And so I'll have different times at which I have switching, that's gonna result in different behaviors, and now I can search for the optimal point at which I'm gonna see a good gene expression. So we can test this out first by looking at just a reporter protein. This is something called green fluorescent protein that's just gonna give us a signal of gene expression being turned on. And you can see all of these profiles look the same in that I have uh, the molecule being produced and then it suddenly goes away. And this point here should represent the point at which the balance between making new protein and degrading protein has now shifted towards degradation because I am not making new protein fast enough. So we can take all of the different samples that we had and then order them to look at the time at which they switch. This OD is a measure of the cell density. So what's the density at which they switch as a function of the member of the library? And there are a couple things to point out. The first is that one of the things that's actually changed a lot in how we do biology is that much, much more of it has become predictable. So when I first started the lab 15 years ago, if I said I wanted to have a range of 30 different expression levels of protein, then I could mix and match a lot of things together, but it would be very hard to predict what the output would be. Instead, there had actually been an effort done by uh, a different group at Berkeley that had synthesized and then tested about 1,000 different variants and characterized them. And so if we looked at, at the prediction of how these were, these were supposed to behave as a function of how they actually behaved, we actually got really good agreement, especially in the lower levels, where those that were predicted to be very weak and therefore switch very late did exactly that. And those that were predicted to be strong and switch early behave the same way as well. The other thing I'll point out, and again, this is more for the students who may um, know this field and the, the faculty who may know this field a little bit better, is that one of the, the reasons why when we first had this idea years ago it didn't work was that we didn't have the right tools available to us. It turns out that the 
only constructs which gave us a variable range that we could play with were at very, very low levels of expression. And when I say low, all of these strengths you can see are normalized to 100%. So the strongest one would be 100%. And they had all been characterized relative to that. We only got acceptable behavior for expression levels below 5%. So when we first started this work a decade ago, we simply didn't have access to materials to allow us to explore this very, very lower end of how the system would behave. So we actually took these samples that gave us some variable behavior and then characterized them first to see, number one, did they actually do what we wanted them to do mechanistically? And what do I mean by that? What's supposed to happen is that I have protein and at a certain point, protein goes away. So we can actually measure the activity of that protein and the wild type here means a cell that we haven't engineered at all. That's just how natural E. coli that I take out of the freezer in my lab is going to behave. This is a positive control where I can only turn on and I can't turn off. And then I have a few different samples here where you can see as a function of time different levels of activity of the enzyme that's being produced. Okay? And the interesting thing to note here is that we start off at levels that are much, much higher than wild type. And maybe this is the best one to look at because it's on all the time. All right? So the default state here that's on is really, really high. But at later times, for our samples that actually gave us interesting results, we go much lower than wild type. So we have a really, really wide range of behaviors that we can explore here. The second thing is to ask, does it phenotypically do what we want it to do? Meaning what's supposed to happen is that I first have high growth, and then as I switch at early time points, the cells should grow less. So what the right plot shows here is that if I have higher ESA I levels, which are strains that are now gonna switch earlier, they're actually growing very poorly compared to either my strain that's not engineered at all or to ones that are switching later. So it's working pretty much the way we expect it to work. Now the question is, does it actually give us any improvement in productivity? So did we actually manage to increase the amount of substrate available so that our product is more productive than it was before? So the results here, this is our intermediate now, myonositol. And because these strains are autonomous, we actually had to struggle to figure out what's the right metric to compare them because they're all sort of different at different times. So we actually picked one particular time point at which all of the cells should have switched and then plotted now the titer or the concentration as a function of the switching time. Um, and what we found is that our best performing variant had about a 20% uh, increase over our wild type version. And this was actually um, comparable to what we found with the system where we were going in and adding a molecule and having it switch at a particular point in time. Okay? So you can see the reference here shows this was published in Nature Biotech. You're probably asking 20% Nature Biotech. Yeah, they would have asked that too. So we asked a couple of other questions and dug a little deeper. The first is, would this hold across different growth conditions or different growth medium? So this we did in what's called a minimal medium where the only carbon available to it was glucose. And the question was, what if we have a richer medium, something that is actually more representative of what we might use uh, in a manufacturing setting? Do we still get the same behavior? The second question is, does this hold across scales? So we had a very particular way of, of culturing the, uh, the organisms in this case. If we change how they're cultured, do we still see the same behavior? And we asked that question for a very important reason. There was a graduate student at MIT named Felix Moser. I happened to be on Felix's thesis committee. And Felix had done some work where he had designed uh, what we call genetic circuits. They worked really well in his home lab. He then went off to the Netherlands and did an internship at a company called DSM. And he got there and he used different media and different cultivation vessels and nothing worked. And he spent a long time figuring out what were the unique characteristics of his system that restricted its performance to this particular set of circumstances. And so we actually wanted our system to be more robust than that, so we decided to test it. So the first thing that we did was to take now the same minimal medium and add a bunch of amino acids. So amino acids are those building blocks for proteins. If you provide the cells with amino acids, they actually grow faster and they're much happier. And what we found was very interesting. It was that the wild type strains um, actually got worse so their production went down because it turns out when you tell the cells, go ahead, grow, they do, and they stop making as much product as they made before. 
whereas our best producer actually made more than it made with a minimal immediate case, so that, such that now we're about 80% better than the wild type compared to the 20% better that we had here. And then we went a step further and used a medium called T12. This is actually a medium that's being used for commercial development of this process at the moment. And now something very interesting happened, which is that for our wild type strains, this is again this control that can't switch at all, and for the latest switcher that looks the most like wild type, we now made very, very little product again, and we suddenly made a lot of acetate. And this is actually a phenomenon well known in biological systems, especially with E. coli, that if you provide more glucose, more food than they can metabolize or can completely consume, they just start spitting out as acetate. Okay? So what we found in this case now was that our best performer, again, the titers are going up, now we're at 1.7 grams per liter here, and we're about five and a half times better than what this wild type control was. Okay? So the wild type strains are getting worse and worse as we continue to have a richer medium, whereas our strains are getting better and better and continuing to display this very core ability to have the switching and improved performance. So what we found was that we actually unexpectedly were able to mitigate buildup of acetate, um, and we actually got consistent behavior across all of our different formulations. So the next question, again, was to ask about scalability, right? So uh, does this actually perform at different scales? And so the reason that's important is that ultimately, for the things that we're working on, we want them to be applicable in a large-scale setting, meaning when you're actually trying to manufacture products that are going to be useful commercially, we want them to be able to work there. The problem, though, is that you have to be able to do your development at much larger scale, as much smaller scales, because it's a lot of investment of time and resources to do these experiments. And so you want to be able to have some confidence that when you do a small scale study, it's going to translate into large scale environment. And then specific to this particular case, the way I describe quorum sensing working to you is that those molecules are supposed to be produced. They come out of the cell, and then they come back in. And so mixing should matter in terms of how that process happens. And we know from lots of studies of scale up that mixing times in these different scales are very different from each other. So we were especially curious to see whether or not there would be any unique problems associated with the specific system that we use. The next data I'm going to show you are actually from uh, making glucaric acid, so going, adding additional steps to the pathway here. And we ended up using um, the rich medium for this uh, simply for the fact that for this particular pathway, or at least this configuration of it, we actually get very, very poor productivity in these very lean media. So we wanted to provide the best circumstances for this. So we had three different scales that we looked at. Our base is a sh what's called a shake flask here. You can see the volume. We use a 20% volume of the total, so 50 milliliter working volume. We had the scale down system that had a one milliliter working volume and then a larger reactor that had a working volume of about 1.4 liters. And so if you look initially now at our shape lab studies, something very interesting happened, which was that our wild type strains now only make acetate and make no product at all. So adding this additional stress made it such that those cells just said, forget it, I'm not gonna play anymore, what are you gonna do, right? And just decided not to make the product at all. Whereas you can see our best case still is making good amounts of product and only product doesn't make any acetate at all. Right? Uh, and if we looked at the scale down model, you can see the numbers are a little bit different. We got slightly higher uh, titers here, although the error bars are larger, but they're comparable in terms of their performance. Okay? So then it was time to look at the benchtop reactor. So this is when I get to tell one of my stories. So the student who did this work came to me one day and said, I don't want to do that experiment. By the way, um, when you have this conversation with your advisor, um, then I'm sure he or she engages you in um, very reasoned intellectual debate, and then you go do the experiment, right? Because your advisor told you to do the experiment. So we're going to play this out. We're going to engage in very reasoned, rational debate. Why don't you want to do the experiment? And he says, well, I think what's happening here is that as acetate builds up, it's an acid. And acids, if you remember from chemistry, cause the pH to drop. So I think the pH here is low. True, no argument there. We measured it, we actually knew the pH there was low. So we said, I don't think it's that these cells can't make product. I think once the pH drops low enough, they have trouble bringing in the glucose, uh, and so that's why they're not very productive. Okay, I'm trying to have the reason debate here, right? Keep going. He says, well, if we go into a reactor, reactors have pH control. 
That's actually why you use reactors, is because they have pH control. And he says, in these, they're not going to drop to very low pH. Okay. Therefore, it's not going to be as bad as this, so I don't want to do the experiment. Okay. So then you have a conversation that starts with, there's no such thing as good data or bad data. Data are just data. Your reaction to your data may be good. Your reaction to your data may be bad. But the data are the data. And it's important to ask questions and get answers to your question. And to be very sympathetic. And at the end of the day, if you don't get agreement, you say, just go do the experiment. Okay? So we go do the experiment. And we found something that we hadn't seen before. Okay? So if we look at our wild type, suddenly we are actually making product. Okay? And it turns out that he was right. I mean, we knew that the pH was going to be neutral in this case. And E. coli has no problem consuming acetate, using it for growth. So what happened when we went into the reactor is that the cells did make acetate, but because the pH was neutral, they could reuse that acetate for growth. And in fact, they did just that. They made a lot more biomass. They made a little bit of glucaric acid, but not very much. And so in our case now with our uh, valve, it worked the same as what we had seen on the smaller scale. We never saw any accumulation of acetate whatsoever, and we still had a significant improvement over the wild type case. Okay, so there are two lessons here. The first is your advisor's always right, unless your advisor is wrong. Right? So I do tell my students that I expect that I will be wrong, and they should tell me when I'm wrong. The only trick is I have to actually be wrong when you tell me I'm wrong. Because if you tell me I'm wrong, and it turns out I'm right, then I have a very long memory. Everything else, I have a very short memory. <laughs> but, but that particular thing, I tend to remember for a long time. And then the second lesson is actually one uh, that a colleague of mine at MIT likes to say. And he says, if you're dealing with metabolic engineering projects where you're trying to get these cells to make chemical compounds, the best product projects are ones where you start from nothing and make anything at all. Because now you get to divide by zero. And you've made your process infinitely better than it otherwise would have been. Right? So that's one of the ways that we are actually teaching these bacteria new tricks, teaching them to actually sense their environment and use that ability to sense as a way of redirecting their metabolism. There's another way that we can think about controlling these systems. And if we look at the same pathway, there's an additional control point. So this is the second enzyme in the pathway where what myox or myonostal oxygenase is doing is producing glucuronic acid, which is the next to last compound in the pathway. And there's something we notice about this very early on, which is that this uh, activity of this enzyme is higher if it's produced when its substrate is actually present. And it turns out to be a little bit unstable. So we design these systems so we get as much productivity out very early on. And that's the way you want to design a bioprocess anyway, because we know as we go for later, later time points, the activity is going to go a little bit down. So if you know that your activity is better when the substrate is present and you're feeding glucose, which is not the substrate, one of the things that you can do is say, well, why don't I just wait and turn on expression, start that DNA going to RNA process after I've built up some of that substrate, because that's going to give me the most productive uh, pathway. And we had demonstrated this with a previous graduate student in the lab, where he could just uh, set up the system in a way that he could go in and manually decide when he could start turning on expression of this enzyme. And you can see under these conditions, the later we turn on expression, the more productive the pathway is. Okay? But, that's not really fun. Now, we're still back to the system of having people go in and have to add things at particular points in time. So uh, I talked about this project several years ago at a conference in Germany. And a woman came up to me and said, would it help if you actually had a protein that naturally binds to this molecule and that can regulate gene expression in the presence of it? And I said, why, yes, it would. And Yulia Fronsky was her name. And she says, well, it turns out we're working with this organism called Carinibacterium glutamicum. And we have identified a transcription factor. That's one of these proteins that will sit on DNA that responds to myonositol. And she had not published the paper yet. She was very generous and shared the paper with us and shared all the sequence information. Um, and we were able to take that and design now a system where we allow this regulatory protein, IPSA, 
to bind to the DNA, and that's going to prevent the R DNA goes to RNA process, so it's off. When we actually produce sufficient amounts of myelin inositol, it can bind to this protein, causing it to come off, much the same way that these AHL signaling molecules do. And when that happens, it allows now for the promoter to be open, and this DNA to RNA transcription process can take place. Okay? And we can actually regulate the expression level of this regulatory protein to somewhat modulate the behavior of the system. So uh, the student who did this work, Stephanie Doon, uh, created uh, five different variants where each of these different five colors represents different levels of this regulatory protein. And the increasing, uh, the direction of increasing promoter strength goes from top to bottom. And then we can actually just provide myon acetal. We use another reporter protein, which is GFP, and just ask, do we turn on expression of that protein in the presence of uh, our ligand or our compound of interest. And you can see for very low levels of this uh, regulatory protein, we get to high levels of our reporter. For uh, higher levels of that protein, it takes more and more of this molecule before it turns on. We can also show that this works if we are providing glucose and then asking the cells to make myelin acetal. And we only see this signal when the myelin acetal being is produced. We don't see it when it's not being produced. So we could use this system and now ask, do we actually get better productivity if we once again allow the cells to decide for themselves when they're going to turn on gene expression and when they're not going to turn on gene expression. And so the no IPSA case is the case where the system is always on. And you can see that we actually do significantly better. P4 here was our best case in being able to improve productivity by allowing the cells to do the decision making and say, OK, I've got enough substrate around. It's now time to turn on production. Now, as you might imagine, this system is actually completely distinct from or orthogonal to the first system that I described for you. So it turns out we can put both of those together. And if we do that, what we find is that independently, we had increases of about two to three fold in the productivity, whereas when we put them together, we increase uh, the productivity by tenfold. And we were using a particular strain of E. coli here that uh, we had identified and others had found actually had a very difficult time making this product. And so getting, when we actually scaled this one up, we got uh, concentrations of about two grams per liter, which is the highest that had been reported in this particular strain. So I'm going to tell one last short vignette here, and then I'll open up for questions. And with our quorum sensing system, the question I get asked most often is, can you control more than one? Again, okay, remember that model of the cell that had all these different dots representing the chemical compounds and all those different lines representing reactions reflects the fact that there's a lot of chemistry going on, and we may need multiple control points to be able to actually have optimal behavior. And so we actually uh, have recently demonstrated that we can integrate two of these quorum sensing systems to give us two different points of control. So the way that this works, we can still actually use the same synthase, so we still have the same AHL molecule that we had from ESA-I, and now we have a different regulatory protein called LUX-R, and this regulatory protein actually acts as an activator. So when it's present, you'll actually have binding of AHL that will turn on uh, expression on this gene. So if we look now as a function of time, um, we should see that gene expression is being turned on as we wait for this AHL to build up. The ESA-R circuit is one that I already introduced to you. This one now uh, acts as a repressor, so initially it's off. But again, uh, AHL binding to it now will allow that to come off of the DNA, turning on gene expression. So we again have this behavior where we go from off to on if we wait long enough. And so just as we did before, we can control the rate of accumulation of AHL by controlling the level of the synthase protein. And that allows us to have a system where if we increase ESA-I, we should decrease the time it takes for the switching to take place. Okay? Now, this system, because the LUX-R acts as an activator, also allows us for a different point of control so that if I increase LUXR expression, then now I can independently control the expression from this circuit that doesn't rely on the control from the first circuit. So we can test this 
by just taking two proteins, m cherry is going to be red, GFP uh, is green fluorescent protein, it's going to be green, and we just ask, what do these profiles look like as we increase the amount of ESA-I and as we increase the amount of LUX-R? And what we find is that for the system that's controlled by the LUX promoter, it depends on both the concentration of LUX-R and the concentration of ESA-I, whereas the, si the system that's controlled by the ESA-R promoter only depends on uh, the ESA-I concentration and is independent of the LUX-R concentration. Okay? So now we've got two knobs that we can turn to be able to control how these pathways are being implemented. So I'll briefly introduce a different system that we've looked at to test this, one in which we make this compound called naringenin. I'm not going to go through the details of those pathways. I'll just point out a couple of design objectives we have as we think about different ways of controlling this pathway. So the first is that we know that Coumarin-CoA is actually an inhibitor of uh, the tyrosine ammonia lyase enzyme. Okay, so this product will actually cause this enzyme not to work. So we want to delay expression of these genes or turning on of those uh, enzymes until we know that we've built up enough of these downstream enzymes that we're not going to accumulate this inhibitory molecule. Okay, so we have one level of timing where we need to give it a little bit of time before this is going to be used. The second challenge that we have is that one of our two substrates, this compound called malonyl-CoA, is actually essential for growth. So this is similar to the first problem that we had, where cells don't want to be able to allow their malonyl-CoA to go to naringenin because they want to be able to use it to make more of themselves. So what we'd like to do in this case now is to repress or turn down the expression of genes that would lead to consumption of malonyl-CoA after we've allowed the cells to grow so that now that substrate is available for the product to be formed. So what we're going to do is to independently vary these ESI levels and the LUXR levels to give us two different inputs to be able to control the way the pathway goes. All right, so um, just a, a cartoon schematic of this, the way this works is that we first are going to have these upstream enzymes be off and those are going to be turned on. And initially, we're going to allow malonyl-CoA to go to biomass. And eventually, we want to shut down that uh, avenue as well. So we use this ESA-R circuit that goes from off to on to control expression of our pathway genes. That's these enzymes that are involved here. Uh, and what we could test first is to say, what if we don't have any AHL, so things aren't really being produced, or if we have AHL, but we add it right at the beginning. So we're taking away this dynamic nature of it and just saying, turn on and turn on all the time. That, that you can see, gives us relatively uh, pretty low productivity. Instead, if we look at either adding in AHL at different times or scanning our library to find the particular variant that allows the switching to happen at the optimal time, we have about a five-fold improvement in our productivity. To accomplish the next part, we use something called DCAS9. I'm happy to explain that later for anyone who's interested, to now repress these genes so that we don't have malonyl-CoA going into biomass. And if we add that to the system, you can see we double our productivity relative to what we could do one-on-one. -on -one. So we actually think this is going to turn out to be a pretty powerful way to actually get cells to do decision-making tied to how they process these pathways and being able to control how much of the flux is going into pathways of interest versus how much is going into uh, building up more of themselves. So let me summarize here and say that we really do believe that biological synthesis is going to be really, really important to giving us alternative ways of making chemical compounds, especially if we want to address the issue of being able to reduce our dependence on fossil-derived feedstocks going in. Uh, I learned uh, in metabolic engineering that you should knock genes out and really, really highly overexpress genes in order to make them uh, make the pathways most effective. That works sometimes, but it's actually not enough. We need more tools in our toolbox to be able to get the best out of these uh, pathways. And then the last point is just that we have uh, applied dynamic control as a way to address this, have found it to be very useful, and there are now uh, many more papers that are coming out where others have adopted similar approaches and shown that being able to now imply an engineer, uh, apply rather, an engineered level of regulation that can actually match what cells do based on evolution uh, can be very effective. So I just want to end by acknowledging uh, the folks uh, of the current uh, members of my group. Uh, Christina Den is the one who's been pushing this work uh, for the most. Uh, but I talked about the work of a number of foreign uh, 
uh, former members of the lab, and I want to acknowledge them as well. Everything I described today was funded either by the NSF through four different grants, actually, uh, over several years, or through the Office of, of Naval Research. And then uh, lastly, I have my presenter declares competing financial interest slide, uh, because the work I talked about for uh, glucaric acid production has been licensed to a startup uh, that I'm a co-founder of, uh, and we are aggressively working towards commercialization of that. Um, so with that, uh, I am, uh, Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be delighted to answer any questions that you have. Only easy questions. Oh, okay. or, or fun questions. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't know how easy, but fun, I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm mind blown. Um, so what's really cool, uh, fascinating that what you've done is you've kind of created these circuits mm -hmm. by kind of reassorting things that natural selection has mm -hmm. already done. Mm -hmm. And I think you've kind of taken pieces and put them together into these chimeric, which is, which is unbelievable to me. Uh, I guess my question is, I think you know, this morning the Nobel in chemistry came out. I'm thinking about Nobel last year, mm -hmm. which was about optimizing mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. kind of modules and components. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, did you, yeah, have you ever done that? Have you yeah. ever, or thought about doing that? Like, so yes. you're able to put together these really cool circuits. Yeah. But what about optimizing yep. kind of individual modules within them? Yes, so, so we certainly have done that. And we have, we've published a couple of papers uh, over the, the most recent one came out uh, last year in 2018. And then we had one that was in 2010. There were both collaborations with a computational structural biologist. So uh, this is a guy named Bruce Tidor in uh, computer science and AI, AI lab and in biological engineering at MIT. And what Bruce is able to do is to take uh, a structure of a protein and then predict mutations that should lead to faster catalytic activity. Uh, and so in the projects that we had with him, actually in both cases, we were less focused on engineering for increased activity and more focused on selectivity. It turns out it's hard to engineer for, for activity in terms of computationally to do that. Uh, it's a, the guidance in terms of how you do rational protein design is a little bit more straightforward for um, uh, binding. So in one particular project, we were actually trying to affect the binding of it. We had one substrate that could give four different products, and we wanted to affect uh, the distribution of those products. In the second case, we actually had an enzyme that we wanted to work on uh, substrates it doesn't normally see in nature, uh, and we needed to bias. There were uh, two different products that could be produced, and we wanted to bias it uh, much more towards ours. So those are uh, uh, projects that we've already done. Um, the Nobel last year uh, went to a, a, a phenomenally uh, incredible person uh, who, uh, okay, I'll tell you that story later, I don't have time for it now. Um, <laughs> uh, Caltech Francis Arnold for directed evolution. And uh, that is the challenge, which is that rational protein design works if you have a structure and you have good ideas about how that structure function relationship works. There are a number of enzymes for which we don't have structures. Um, and in our particular case, we want to be able to use directed evolution. Uh, the challenge is that the library sizes you get from directed evolution are very large, and they have to be to explore the broad space of, of possible mutations that may lead to something beneficial. And so we have been challenged for a long time uh, to develop effective screens to be able to handle that. Uh, it turns out for uh, the myonositol uh, trigger that I showed you, that's effectively a sensor for myonositol, and so we've been able to use that to improve the productivity of that first enzyme by about 25%. Um, and the second enzyme, we uh, did a directed evolution project a number of years ago for, uh, but as Francis will tell you, you get what you screen for. Um, and the screen that we had set up was one that was based on growth. Uh, and the cells are always smarter than we are. And so they found a different way to actually address the problem other than increasing the catalytic activity. So I actually have active work going on now. We actually think we have a good sensor for the second step of the pathway um, that will allow us to do that kind of work. And I'll, I'll tell you what I'm most interested in and, and what we're focusing on is, um, for the most part, when you do that uh, optimization of individual steps, you do it for individual steps one at a time. But the challenge in biological processes is that what is rate limiting or rate determining changes. 
right, as a function of what the relative concentrations are over time. And so we're interested in exploring co-evolution of enzymes to see if that actually will give us a, a different outcome. I don't know if it's going to be better or not, but to see do you actually arrive at a different endpoint if you co-evolve enzymes rather than evolving them sequentially. And if you do them sequentially, you, know, you have to do the first one first to make sure you have the best uh, circumstances for the second one. But what are the, the trade-offs between that? So we're just now uh, getting to the point where we think we have appropriate screens to be able to handle the kind of capacity that you get with a directed evolution exercise. Yeah, Kim. So this might be too challenging to think about, <laughs> but um, you know, so in some cases, uh, enzymes use like substrate channeling. Yes. Right. So yes. and that can actually really increase the efficiency of of reactions. Yeah. Whereas those. Um, enzyme systems have been sort of co-evolved yep. so that the, the different enzymes, you know, either mm -hmm. they're multi-subunit mm -hmm. or, or they're tethered together yeah. in some fashion. Yeah. Is there any possibility that something like that could be yeah. could work for you? So, um, so we actually, in, for this specific project, we actually did that. We had, um, and it was based on this observation that the activity of this second enzyme was much better when its substrate was present. And so we worked with um, a collaborator at Berkeley, a guy named John Duber, um, to build, so he built protein-protein co-localization devices based off of uh, peptide scaffold. So he looked at uh, binding domains, uh, the, there were SH3, GBD, and PDZ binding domains, and you could actually uh, discretize the two halves of those binding domains and put one ligand on the scaffold, put the, or put one, um, uh, put the, uh, the receptor on the scaffold, put the ligand part on the proteins, and then you could direct assembly of those proteins into these higher order um, complexes. Um, we actually, we got some improvements there from that, but um, what was interesting about it, and, and we got very excited about it, and we tried it for lots of other things, and didn't work for any of the other things at all. Um, and then we got interested in some of the theory behind it, and I had a student who did a, a pretty simple reaction diffusion model. So, because what you're describing, uh, if, if I think about this as a chemical engineer, the question is, if I have two enzymes here, versus two enzymes here. If they're here, what I'm doing is reducing the diffusion distance between active sites. And so it matters if they're here versus here, only if the concentration here versus here is different. If the concentration is the same across all conditions, then it shouldn't matter how close they are because it's the effective concentration that you're gonna uh, get to anyway. And so when we did some modeling, it turned out that what the modeling predicted is that the channeling, or if you will, the co-localization would be effective um, under cases of relatively low productivity, because those were ones where you would have the concentration gradients. But as your pathways got more productive, the impact was less and less. And it was exactly what we had seen, which was in cases where the, the case that we published, um, the, the sort of uh, flagship, if you will, example, there was a 77-fold improvement and productivity from not having the scaffolds to having the scaffolds, we saw a five-fold improvement. The 77-fold improvement went from 10 milligrams per liter to 770 milligrams per liter. The five-fold improvement went from 500 milligrams per liter to 2.5, right? So we were already approaching the limit of the pathway being fast enough that you actually couldn't see any concentration differences. There was no concentration gradient between the active sites. And there's been some additional, more detailed um, theoretical studies that have backed that up. So there are specialized cases where I still think that this will be incredibly effective. That involves toxic intermediates. So if you don't want the intermediates freely diffusing to other parts of the cell, that's important. Um, or potentially, or uh, especially reactive intermediates. Right, so the ones that are going to uh, be converted on by something else before they get to your active site. Um, and so we've done some work. I still have one project uh, that uh, the paper is under revision now where a postdoc looked at some of this tethering, but again, for a very specialized case. So I think uh, it's an interesting way of doing it, but it's not, we certainly have seen this. I've talked to a lot of other people anecdotally where um, the when it works versus when it doesn't work, we're just sort of being able to gather enough information to be able to parse that out to have it be really designable. Right? I'm an engineer, so we want things to be predictable. So the question is, what are those circumstances where you say, yep, this is where I want to go to um, the co-localization of the tethering, and this is where it's not really going to matter much. And, yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Um, 
in the last example that you gave, mm -hmm. how often do you run into the situation where you have in product inhibition yeah. of an upstream enzyme? Yeah. How do you usually deal with that? So it's, it's very common for natural biological pathways. Um, and it is a way for the cell to regulate their expenditure of energy. All right, so what do I mean by that? So amino acid biosynthesis is a great example where um, oftentimes, uh, the final product, uh, leucine is a great example, will inhibit the first enzyme in the pathway. And that happens so that the cell will recognize you've got enough of this product so you can stop sending more down the pipeline. Um, so that's actually pretty common. Um, and we talked about a particular way of, of handling this. Other ways that, that folks have addressed the problem are to actually using uh, directed evolution, as Brandon mentioned, to be able to identify feedback um, resistant mutants that no longer respond to that end product metabolite. And that will allow you to accumulate very large quantities. Um, and the particular pathway that we were looking at, there haven't yet been any of these uh, mutants that have been identified that are um, free of the inhibitory effect. there. Um, oh, over there. Sorry. <laughs> I saw a hand there. I didn't see the mic. <laughs> but I got the mic. Um, <laughs> you have the power if you have the mic. He's got the next one. The next <laughs> um, I, I admit that I may be one of the people that, uh, uh, that, that you lost early on, so that you may have already answered this, but I, I wonder how stable some of the processes yeah. that you're yeah. developing are. I mean, aren't the, um, aren't the bugs uh, likely to evolve a taste yeah. for the yeah. final product and start metabolizing it? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, and I did not answer that already before. So it turns I'm, out- I'm so relieved. <laughs> so E. coli have already evolved the ability to grow on our substrate, on our second intermediate and our final product. So it'll grow on glucose, it'll grow on glucuronic acid, it will grow on glucaric acid. The only thing it won't eat is myon acetal, which is the first intermediate. So for these strains, we do delete, so we re remove the enzymes, the genes that encode for the enzymes that allow for those uh, metabolites to be processed. So um, that's the first question there is that the answer, the first part of it is we know that the cells can do it already, and so we have removed the ability to do that. Um, the, second the second part of that answer, though, is that you're right. If you expose the cells to a compound long enough, you do expect for evolution to take over, and they will come up with ways to be able to utilize that pathway. Because we are looking at this from a production perspective, we just don't have enough generations. There's not enough time for those mutations to evolve to the point where you actually are able to now acquire, reacquire the ability to consume those products uh, once we've knocked out uh, those genes. And we don't, we don't knock them out with point mutations so that they can revert. We do complete removal of uh, the genes that encode for those catabolic pathways. Uh, and so far, we've had no evidence at all that, that they will revert. Um, we, we did actually in the case where we are trying to downregulate expression of the genes, I, I didn't go over the details, but I mentioned we had a, a way of doing this where we could add in a small molecule. We did actually see escape mutants for those. So we found uh, strains that would stop growing and would suddenly start growing again. And when we sequenced those, there was a single point mutation that prevented their ability to make the protein that degraded the target protein that we were going after. Um, we don't see that in the quorum sensing system, and we're not entirely sure why, but the quorum sensing systems seem to be much more robust to these types of escape mutations. And so we, uh, so far, have not had any problems with stability uh, the way we've configured these most recent systems. I have, I have a, a, Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'm a graduate student, and I'm actually working on engineered E. coli for arsenic remediation. Mm -hmm. So my question is when like we are trying to scale up, how do you deal with like how to uh, how to deal with the uh, relatively low yield to like we we use a lot of bacteria mm -hmm. to uh, get our molecules out, but mm -hmm. how do you deal with the relatively low yield to the to the uh, product to bacteria ratio, and how do you separate your pro like how do you separate your product yeah. since the bacteria have a lot of byproducts themselves? Mm -hmm. 
like floating around the media. Yeah. So a couple different questions. Let me answer the first one, the second one first, which is the downstream part, the separation. So um, we do see byproducts. We actually, these we've engineered enough that the byproducts are relatively few. So we still see a small amount of acetate and the systems that we're really scaling up uh, to larger scale, we still see a small amount of acetate. Chemically, the final product we have is different enough from the acetate that in our uh, purification process, which relies predominantly on um, precipitation, um, we don't see, we don't have problems in terms of, of purifying that. And that's true because, now I showed you here very low titers, but the work that the company is doing, the titers are much higher than that. We're 60, 80 grams per liter now. Um, and so at those kinds of concentrations, then your uh, byproducts are much, much lower. And so the, the contamination, if you will, from byproducts uh, is pretty much non-existent in those cases. Your, your first question, if I understood it correctly, was about scaling up when the yield is low. Um, and the challenge there is that you can't effectively scale when the yield is low. You have to, to keep pushing on the process and working on the process to be able to get those yields higher. Because when you're, if you're looking at arsenic um, remediation, for example, if, you're, if the process is too slow um, and you're using a, a bacteria to do it, you have to worry about the viability of that bacteria and its ability to keep doing what you need it to do across very long time scales if the rate at which it does that is very low. Um, and so we, we work very hard to try to push towards levels that actually make sense for scaling because there are some cases where it just doesn't make sense, right? So the, the samples that I showed you, if we're making two grams per liter, we're not gonna scale two grams per liter. That's just not enough. We have other ways of doing this and other configurations that allow us to get to those titers that make sense to now go into more of a, of a scaled environment. Yes, sir. Um, Professor, a couple quick questions. One is the follow-on here. Yeah. Um, what issues do you see as you look at migrating commercial production from batch to continuous mm -hmm. production? Because mm -hmm. a couple of these questions mm -hmm. have related to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the second is, where are you in terms of defining theoretical maximum yields? Yeah that you can get out of the process. Yeah. So, so the, the second question is, is easier than the first. Um, well, shorter than the first. <laughs> um, we can, so the, the theoretical yields are, are relatively easy to define, because that's just based on stoichiometry. So we know what the absolute upper limit is, and we always have targets um, approaching that, or targets to get to that. And um, in our best cases, when we're starting from an intermediate rather than starting from glucose, our yields are 100%. Right? We can, anything we put in, we can convert. Um, if you're starting from glucose, you're never gonna get to 100% because you do have to sacrifice some product to make the cells, that make the enzymes in the first place. Um, and so for those, the, the challenge of getting to, to higher yields is, is harder than that. Uh, the continuous question, the continuous processing question is a great one. And um, I'm a chemical engineer. Right? And so, and I was a chemical engineer raised in the, in the early 90s before anybody was talking about biotech to any extent. So every homework problem I ever had involved a distillation column and, a, you know, and, a, and, a, and an open system and a continuous system. Right? Um, all my summer internships were, well, except for one, were sort of these, uh, these large scale uh, continuous systems as well. Um, and the reason the chemical industry has gone that route is because the economies of scale are fantastic. You're able to have lower footprint of your facilities. The productivities are fantastic. Uh, biology has not been continuous, um, with one exception. The, the, the clear dominant exception of continuous processing is uh, municipal wastewater treatment. Uh, with uh, uh, cycling between aerobic and anaerobic digesters. Uh, that's a process that's been well established for decades, um, except when it has upsets. Right, um, but it's very complex, and there's a wider there's a wider range of what comes in. Um, there is um, a, a very low tolerance for what comes out in terms of reducing your BOD and COD, your um, biological oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand, below a certain level. Um, but there's enough flexibility in how those systems are run to be able to adjust them to be able to achieve it. If you're looking at continuous processing for biological systems for chemical production, there are two really major challenges to this. The first one is um, what I describe as a problem for mechanical engineers, sterility. 
If you have an open system and you're growing biological systems, and by the way, when we're in the lab, we use antibiotics to keep things sterile, but that's not practical on large scale at all. Um, and so if you're, you're growing at this large scale, then um, you have to, we have to have better containment. So the actual physical infrastructure has to be better to try to minimize the chances that something's gonna get in as you're growing these systems, as you're uh, operating these systems. The other challenge with biological systems is evolution. So this comes back to the question that was asked, which is that cells will evolve. So if you are growing them for longer and longer periods of time, then you do run the risk of losing your productivity um, or uh, losing other aspects of the culture that, that might be robust. And my, the uh, knowledge I have that's probably deepest about this, and, and that's putting it mildly to say, or generously to say it's, it's deep, um, is ethanol industry. So in Brazil especially, they've experimented a lot with continuous uh, ethanol production. Uh, and what they find is they can do effectively sort of semi-continuous production. So you can run for long periods of time with uh, what's called a draw and fill. So you, you, know, you, you let it go, you then will uh, withdraw a certain volume and then put fresh meat in to let it keep going. And you can do that for months at a time and have really good productivity. Um, but eventually they lose productivity and they have to stop. Uh, and the composition of the culture changes during that time because they get contaminants. Um, some of the contaminants are actually beneficial. They find that the composition uh, from what they start with to where the end of the really high productivity are completely different, but they're still productive, right? So some of them can be okay, uh, but you have a problem with that. The, the evolutionary issues, though, I don't know of any way to stop evolution. I'm not sure I'd want to stop evolution. Um, but I don't know of any way to do that. So my own sense, my own, um, this is my feeling about how I think it's gonna evolve. I think we will figure out how to have more continuous bioprocessing, especially for chemical manufacturing. For pharmaceuticals where you can have really high margins um, and you can absorb more of the cost of manufacturing and the price of the product, then I think um, there will be more specialized cases where it becomes a very common way to do it. But for uh, chemicals and moving towards this vision of replacing more and more of the fossil-derived materials with bio-derived materials, I think we've got to figure it out. And I think the sterility issues and the containment, we can figure out. Again, that's, that's a, an engineering problem. The evolutionary issues, I don't think we'll be able to avoid. And so what we'll likely um, arrive at is a case where continuous doesn't mean 50 weeks out of the year as it does for a chemical process, but it probably means running things 12 to 20 weeks at a time. And then you stop and start over again, clean everything out really well. Um, and that'll still give you significant advantages over just being batch or fed batch. But I'm, I'm skeptical about whether or not we'll get to truly continuous manufacturing with biological systems because of the, the problems with evolution. Is the liquor industry a relevant model? Is the liquor industry? Yeah, so, so years ago, I, I talked to, to folks uh, from brewing especially. Um, there was a, a brewery in Europe, um, I can't remember if it was uh, Belgium or the Netherlands, where they looked at continuous manufacturing uh, and they stopped because it affected taste. Right? It was more productive, but the, the flavor profiles that develop actually are tied to this dynamic way of going through the batch process. Uh, and so they found that, yep, they could definitely make, you know, per unit time, they could make more beer. This was a, a, a brewery uh, in this case. Um, but the taste profile wasn't what they wanted, and so they stopped. Um, I might have misunderstood something, but I was wondering, once you discovered that pathway using the enzymes from the mouse and the yeast and stuff, why you couldn't then just treat it like a conventional chemical reaction yeah. and synthesize those enzymes separately yep. and introduce yeah. the substrates? Yeah. So, so good question. So what you're describing is known as cell-free biosynthesis. There are uh, folks who are working on that, and that's another area. That actually would be much more amenable to, to continuous processing because you wouldn't have living, dividing, uh, growing cells anymore. Um, and there are lots of people who are doing that. We, the short version is we don't do that in my lab, so we haven't looked at it. A slightly longer version of that is for this particular pathway, one of the challenges you have, and I didn't go through those details, is that you actually have to go from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate um, to then another compound, and then it has to be phosphor dephosphorylated. And so that process of going from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate requires energy, which means it requires ATP. And there are um, some effective ways of regenerating ATP in cell-free systems. Um, we actually had a, a 
collaboration with a lab at Northwestern that specializes in those systems. And for reasons that we don't understand, at least when they first tried it, they couldn't get this particular pathway to work. And my suspicion is because it's, it's related to those upstream steps. The, the two downstream ones, you can definitely start with the myonositol and you can have purified enzymes and go down the line, that's perfectly fine. But there seems to be a bit of a challenge in getting that upstream part of it to work in a cell-free system. An additional answer is that um, that is effective only up to a certain point economically. And what I mean by that is, if I'm going to synthesize those three enzymes, I need three separate fermentations in order to make enough of the enzyme to then purify them and put them back together again. And so you have to make sure that the cost associated with the individual manufacturing of those enzymes is not too large to be able to eat up any of your potential profits. So the advantages that we have, especially for multi-step pathways, is that you have one tank, you have one cell that's making all the enzymes, they're all there, and again, if you get your productivities high enough, then um, your manufacturing costs end up being a lot lower. I'll close out, I guess, there's another question. You get the last word. Well, I get the last word. Unless I answer you and then I get you the last word. You will get definitely the last word. <laughs> Um, so, I'm not a chemist, obviously. You know, I'm, I'm just a dumb uh, information theorist. And what was interesting is that you have these bugs that you've designed, so that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. But then you also described applying different inputs to these bugs yeah. to get them to do different things. Yeah. To me, it's completely, I, I don't even know how you come up with the pathways. They're just so complex. That's why I'm not a chemist. I can only remember <laughs> F equals MA and a few other roles, a few, a few other rules. So I guess what I'm asking is, in exploring the chemical space, mm -hmm. which is kind of what you're doing, mm -hmm. have folks begun to give thought to, now you've got your widget that you've designed genetically, yeah. and exercising that thing in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm asking, is there, is there a rational way to exercise these widgets? So there is, um, there's, a, there's a rational way, or at least uh, potential rational ways to, the, to do the upstream part of it. So I described a, a fairly deliberate process that we went through identifying these three enzymes. Um, we've done other projects where we draw a structure on the board and there's no known biological route to that. And so then that process of identifying enzymes uh, is a lot more complex. And there have been algorithms developed to help address that part of the problem. We're still not at the point where we can simulate metabolism in a cell. You can, you can, there are some pretty good um, uh, simulations that allow you to simulate basic growth by black boxing a lot of stuff, right? And they can, they can replicate population level dynamics for microbial cells, but not at the level of actually including metabolism and including novel pathways or heterologous pathways and things like that. So we're, we're still not at that point where we can do that reliably. The, the closest that we've gotten is that there are um, a set of computational approaches known as, as uh, flux balance analysis, which relies on stoichiometry. Right? Mass is conserved, and so you can look at all of the reactions of a cell and know that as long as mass is conserved, you have to keep track of everything. And so you can make predictions about how there's going to be a redistribution of different uh, molecules based on changes that you make. Um, and when that works well, um, it works great, and people write papers about it. When it doesn't work, uh, which happens a lot, nobody writes anything about it. And so, so the problem is it's very hit or miss. We've had a couple of collaborations where there have been things that have been predicted that just simply don't work. And so um, I think the reason for that is that the stoichiometric models are static. They don't include any dynamics, and there are some very important aspects of the dynamics here. And the models that will effectively incorporate the dynamics um, just aren't there yet to be able to give you a reliable exercising, as you call it, to be able to predict how the cells are going to behave. So fortunately for me, I'm an experimentalist, so that's OK. Um, and we're sort of stuck with doing a lot of this by uh, experimentation. Okay. All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you all very much.